as I say in other kinds of documents, right now, if you look around the world, people are moving. Rich people are moving with passports, and poor people are moving without passports, but people are moving. And if you look at the history of the world, read the Bible. It's about the movement of people. <coughs> I don't read anywhere in the old in Genesis that Abraham and Sarah went by the Canaanite consulate to get a visa before they left. Obviously, it's a different world. They were people in the movement. And I would argue that if you read the Bible through migratory eyes, you will see that people are always in the movement. But right now, there's a growing demand for workers. Remember that when the unemployment rate in California went about 12 to 13 percent, it never got above about 5 percent for the undocumented. The unemployment rate for the undocumented has always been lower than the national rate of unemployment. So that means there are jobs out there, it's just who's willing to do them. And the, uh, the visa levels have not changed significantly, future flow. The undocumented are staying because of the difficulties of crossing the border today. Again, when I was young, most people crossed on their own. You crossed one time with a Coyote with a border crosser, the next time you did it on your own. It wasn't that complicated. Today, it's thousands of dollars. So, obviously, if you can avoid it, you don't want to spend thousands of dollars every time you're going to cross, so you don't cross. And as we hear people talking about, well, they're, they should get in line and get a visa. There is no line. No line exists. If you are a farm laborer working in Central California, there is no visa line to get into. There is no way that you could say, if I got in this line, I would eventually get a visa, even if it's a five-year wait, a ten-year wait, or a twenty-year wait, I would eventually get a visa to work in California. There is no such line. Look at immigration policy. There is no such line. So it's, to me it's always, it's, sad, it's laughably sad when people say, well they're jumping to the front of the line. What line? And the Obama administration has proudly proudly stated every year that they broke their own deportation record from the year before. And they're very proud of it. They announced it every year. This year we got over 400,000. That's what we're at right now. If we had a policy that said, we know that people are going to come to work, therefore, let's regulate. Okay. We more or less know that there's a harvest season in Central California. Uh, if you've lived here, you know there's a harvest season. And you know more or less what period it is. And you know that during that period, you need, in the Central Valley, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 more people to effectively go through that whole process. From the time that you start raising crops to the time you start cleaning out the land, depending on what the crop is, to you know, your grapes and your, your raisins and your you know, table grapes and wine grapes and all of these things, there's a season. And to make that work, you need 300,000 people. I'm just making up numbers. I, I haven't checked the numbers, but I know, it's, I know I'm not that far off. If there was a line, the United States government would have an H-1 and H-2 visa for temporary agricultural workers for California. And it would have a policy, okay, if you want to come as a worker, you get a four-month visa. This is how you apply for it, this is what it looks like, and this is when you have to leave the country again. That would be, there's a line. Okay, we need, you know, we need a certain number of workers in central Kansas for this kind of thing. There would be a line. That's what the line, when we say, there is no line, there is no such policy to have to regulate that. I can tell you that the vast majority of undocumented, if they could come legally to do the same work, they would do it legally. And a good, solid majority of them would go back if they could move back and forth. Those aren't options. They used to be options. If you're a Latino pastor, if you've worked amongst the undocumented, 
pastors, you know, how many times prayer meeting time. Pray for my cousin. They're coming tonight. What's that code for? They're coming. They're crossing the border. What do you pray? <laughs> The author, sociologists, they did a study where they tracked with undocumented people and how they attributed their crossing to God's work. That's what they call a migration miracle. Would the average American Christian assume that God is at work there? No, I, I, and I'm trying to be honest. I'm not trying to be facetious. Would the average American Christian assume that God was at work and then being able to get across the board. I'll ask you, would you assume God was a book? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that, that, that we're in a friendly audience. I hope I am. I'm going to check your check your door when I'm giving these kinds of talks. <laughs> but I'm assuming that I'm in a fairly friendly audience. How many of you would say, if the person made it across that comes to church next Sunday and says, God blinded Would you be able to say amen? Or would you, or would you swallow that hard? What would be your assumption? What do you pray for? Lord, blind the official? Lord, may they get caught by a good official that won't beat them, that won't... Lord, may they not die of thirst? Lord, if it's women, may they not be raped. What do we pray? And this is this is not an uncommon prayer meeting. This is where I'm starting from. What does ethics and Christian ethics look like from the other side? And again, because I think I'm in an audience where we can ask those questions, I want you to not only think about, well, we have to be merciful. What does ethics look like from the other side? What is just? What is correct? What is right before God? Remember, human laws change. Where am I starting? Rush Limbaugh has a skewed view. President Obama has a skewed view. All of us start from a certain perspective, and we have to think seriously about how we got from where we are to where we need to be and how and why. Assuming that we really want to have a Christian response, why is it different? One of the problems is where we start the conversation from. Those that tend to be pro immigration reform usually start the conversation somewhere around mercy. Those that start the conversation there see the undocumented as the poor and the oppressed, people that are being treated wrongly. Oh, that is true. But at the end of the day, usually it's about us good people helping those poor people. And, if we're perfectly honest, it makes me feel good. I'm helping those, those poor people. But those people are over there. Those people are outside of my circle. Those people, yes, I'll be, I'll be a good citizen. I'll be a Hey, I'm a man. I will figure out something. I'm a good person. I'm a good Christian. Others start from Romans 13. They say, 
remember who Paul's talking about. The people that threw him in jail off the prayer. So he's and, and the people he disobeyed fairly regularly. So we forget, we tend to forget when we read Romans 13 that Paul is talking about the Roman Empire, the ones that killed Jesus. About the Roman Empire, the ones that threw him in jail fairly regularly. The Roman Empire that would persecute the church. And so we tend to, to use Romans 13 in interesting kinds of ways when we start. But the concern there, and I want to take it seriously, I don't want to, I don't want to belittle that concern, is that society needs laws to have structure and to have order. And that when you do not obey, when you do not respect, when you don't maintain structure and order, societies fall apart. That is true. So if you start from there, as much as you may want to try to find a solution, if that's your starting point, you find it hard to, to move from there because you go, that's, this is the law. Of course, I'm going to say, laws change. So if one group of people, I would say, often helps the undocumented for all the wrong reasons, and the other gets stuck in kind of a static understanding of law, I would invite us to think about, and if some of you have read Danny Carroll's book on immigration, that we need to stop, we need to start way further back. Are we all created by God? Is the earth the Lord's? And how do we understand justice? Not as a legal term, but as a moral term before God. Why is it difficult? Well, it's difficult because it has to do with how we understand being an American. How do we understand national identity? And there's a sense of, of a fear of loss. The United States is changing. The U.S. Census Bureau estimates that somewhere in the decade of 2040, the majority of people in the United States will no longer be of Northern European white descent. They'll still be the single largest group, and I'm sure will hold power well through the 21st century if Jesus doesn't come, but will no longer be over 50% of the population. Welcome to 2040 in the Central Valley. It already happened here. Is it 32% white? Somewhere in the 35%? If I remember correctly the numbers. It already happened in the Central Valley. You'd never know it by looking at who runs the place. But 2040 already happened. So, how do you deal with issues of identity? In that kind of environment. How do you deal with issues of identity when the white, and I use that term advisedly, northern European descent the population of the United States is on a steady decline? The largest group of incoming fresh of white incoming freshmen into colleges in the United States that will ever exist in the United States was in 2006, and it's dropping and it's going to drop quite a bit. If it weren't for the minority and immigrant populations, the United States would be in a population crisis like many countries in Europe. White folks aren't reproducing themselves. And that's in the nature of how populations grow and decline. If you just took the white population, it is not reproducing itself. In other words, it's not having enough children to replace those who are not. That's 
a demographic fact. God seems to like foreigners. <laughs> what can I tell you? If you read, like I said, I'm teaching a class called Church and Mission in Global Context. And I'm going to sit down and start walking. Um, Church and Mission in Global Context. And I told them that throughout the quarter, the way we were going to read first the Bible, and then our church is growing, was going to be through migration. If you read the Bible through the eyes of migration, you realize that God seems to often work through migration. You've got to leave your land. You're not going to understand the promise unless you move. Abraham, Sarah. Israel and Egypt, you're not going to understand the promise unless you move. Israel, when was it most faithful? Not when it had a stable king, not when Solomon had this fairly extensive kingdom. In fact, that's probably why, that was probably Israel at their worst. When did they realize that God had a plan for a whole world? During the exile. If you read the prophets, which are the prophets that seem to get it that God has a plan for all the world? The prophets of the exile. In the prophet of exile, Ezekiel. Why did you lose the land? Because you oppressed the alien. At least 20 times. They're to respect the rights of the foreigner, and the prophets say that the reason for the exile is the unjust treatment of foreigners. It's in your Bible and mine too, so I'm not. Uh, the Bible clearly presents God's commitment to those without legal, political, social, or economic support. One of the things we'll read throughout Scripture is that how you're to treat the widow, the orphan, and the poor. Who are these people? Well, in a patriarchal society, a widow has no social standing. An orphan has no family to network, no family to find him or her a spouse so that they're connected. In a rural agricultural society, family keeps you connected. It's having parents and grandparents that means that you're going to have a good spouse so that you can have a good future for your own children. The Bible clearly pushes in this direction. Of course, we do have the issue of how do we deal with this issue of obedience to God? Scripture does call believers to submit to human authority. I do remind us calls us to submit to human authority. Submission is not necessarily obedience. Peter and John give a perfect example. <coughs> Peter and John tell the authorities, we have to obey God first. Now, they didn't fight getting thrown in jail. They would be submitted. If I choose to do this, I know there are consequences. And I am willing to submit. I accept the consequences. <coughs> are there any immigration officials here before I make my <laughs> I confess, I have helped undocumented people. Not directly. But because I was the pastor and it was the only person that both the Coyotes and the family trusted, I have taken money, picked up people. During the 1980s, during the worst of the civil wars in Central America, I had you know, I was part of the sanctuary movement. And I did take people to try to get them to Canada, where they were 
accepted. I confess. I also knew that if I got caught, I could be thrown in jail. And I accepted that consequences. I would submit to the authority. I would argue that that's what Paul's talking about. I recognize there's a law. The law may be unjust, but there is a system of authority. And if I choose, if I believe that God is calling me to go against it, I also accept that there will be consequences. That's submission. Okay? So that's why I asked before, before I made the confession, I have given you the details. I think there is a statute of limitations on, on the sanctuary movement. <laughs> One of the demographers that worked for ATS, and she did a report recently, about two weeks ago. The number that I just mentioned, the largest group of incoming freshmen, white incoming freshmen, has already passed. It's a steady decline. What? The fastest rate of secularization and of atheism and agnosticism is amongst white folk. So, they're not reproducing themselves and they're more likely to be unfaith or anti-faith. So, 2040, that demographic shift is going to happen in the churches a lot sooner than it happens in society. In other words, we are probably only 10 or 15 years out where on any given Sunday the majority of people that will actually go to church or with the growing non-Christian populations, the people that will actually practice their faith, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, other religions, will not be white. Who's going to be in power still? White secularization minority religious. That's the future. Unless the Lord brings a pretty powerful revival. And I pray for it. But if we look at current trends, and if the Lord continues to work in the way the Lord is working, that's what the United States is going to look like. The churches are going to be full of minority people. Third thing, is that most of those minority people are not going to go to traditional white churches. Last time I was in this building, this was an evangelical covenant church. It's been a few years. I was a student at the University of the Seminary. So that's, that was in the last century, by the way. <laughs> I'm a child of the last century. And today it's a Latino four-square church, right? Who's going to church? I have to acknowledge the basis of their fear. In other words, I can't act like there isn't a there isn't a real fear there. I can't I can't start by accusing you must be a terrible person. Do I build a relationship? Because one of the things that happens is that most of us. The way I, I usually say it, uh, I usually know I'm a, I usually know persons that are conservative if they feel comfortable with people more conservative than them, but not more liberal. And I usually know persons are liberal because they feel more comfortable with people more liberal than them, but not with people more conservative than them. The gospel calls us to cross those boundaries. So how do I create a space where I can actually start a conversation is, first of all, by building a relationship. In other words, do I maintain my relationship with that person who's angry, frustrated, so that I can earn the right to talk to that person? I don't have the right to go tell that person, you know, you're out to lunch. Unless I've built a relationship with them and maintained that relationship and demonstrated that I care about them and I care about why they're afraid. And I care about the things that, that make them afraid. Then 
I can maybe begin to earn the right to ask some questions. Back in the last century, when I was a young Mennonite brother pastor here in the Central Valley, one of the leaders of the Mennonite Brethren Church, and I will not give any more details because if you're Mennonite Brethren and you know history, you might be able to figure out who I'm talking about. And I don't want to do that. That's, that would be unfair. Back about the time when uh, here in California we were voting on English-only initiatives back in the 80s, I was serving as uh, the home mission for the Pacific District Conference. Encouraging churches to think about their Latino neighbors. And I remember being in one of the large MB churches here in the Central Valley. Uh, I was asked to do adult Sunday school, and it was a couple hundred people. To talk about caring about your Latino neighbors. Very first question after I spoke What do you think about the English only initiative? Luckily, there was somebody else in the room who was white who just said, Well, that's not the, you know, that's not the focus of today's topic. Because it wasn't, but it, it would have gotten a soft base. But in the middle of all of that, approaching another church, we were trying to encourage them to think about their Latino neighbors. And, and one of the leaders of the church asked the question Well, will that church, if you start something, will you minister in Spanish? And we said, well, we haven't done a clear demographic study. We don't know enough about the community other than that there's Latinos. But very likely there would be some Spanish. I mean, that's almost a given. But we don't know that. We can't say that ahead of time because we haven't really you know, seen the community well yet. And so we don't, we don't make that assumption, but very likely. And this leader said, you know, I'm against bilingual education. I'm against the bilingual ballot. I believe in English only, so I guess I need to be against the Bible church. Those were, to him, they made logical sense. Another one of those leaders sold cars. And he sold used cars. And I knew who his clients were. Farm workers. Who buys used cars? <clears throat> working class people. And who are the working class people? Mostly Latinos. I asked him. I knew that he had a similar stance. And I asked him, do you ever advertise on Spanish language radio? I knew the answer. Well, of course he does. He wants to sell cars. And I just, because I had, I had built enough of a relationship, and I said, you don't see any disconnect between your anti-use of Spanish and, and actually supporting Spanish language media. No disconnect? Hey, e e economics always trumps politics. But I could only do that because we had sat in enough meetings together I have been willing sometimes to take some flack from, to hear some pretty racist things. You know, men and brethren don't say racist things, but I heard a few racist jokes from my wonderful brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And that's when I earned the right to actually be able to even say that. And so that's that's hard work. You know, we wish we could just convince people to just kind of. I wish I could evangelize with a baseball bat. I'm a pacifist, but I wish I could evangelize with a baseball bat. Come to Jesus or else. Come to Jesus, I'll send them to you. I'll send you to him. It doesn't work that way. So we have to build relationships. And that's slow, and that's painful, and that's patience. So, where are we at today in the middle of all the discussions about immigration reform? Right now, we have several options. We can maintain the status quo. What does the status quo look like? Well, when the economy really went south, a few 
migrants left, and then Obama has been trying to deport them in massive numbers. And so the estimates, I mean, how you count people that don't want to be counted is always uh, a mystery to me. But the estimates say, you know, 2007, 2008, there was about 12 million. That dropped to about 11 million, and we're now back to about 11.5 million. Who's counting? How they're counting? Those are, you know, like I said, uh, they're intelligent guesses. So, if we continue the status quo, we continue to strengthen an underground society and an underground economy. That's what happens. We continue to strengthen the advantage of building tunnels under the border. I'm a historian. I would like to argue that any time a society builds a wall, they build it because they already lost. If you have to build a wall, you're already lost before you started. 